five and three, two, one. Bam, 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 bam. We're live for a new episode of the Electric Podcast. I am Fred Lambert, your host, and as usual, I'm joined by Seth Wintraub, coming, on, coming us live from Vermont. How are you doing, Seth? I'm good. Super. And we're going to have actually more than uh, just us two on this podcast this week. So a special treat for you, the very elusive but very brilliant Jamie Dow is going to join us later on the show to talk a little bit about uh, his experience with Fisker in the last, uh, I, don't, I don't know when he did that uh, drive. It was last week, I think. So last that. week, yeah. Uh, but the ocean and he got some time with the pair too. Uh, so he's going to give us his impression on those. If you haven't read his post about it already this week, I suggest you do because uh, it's uh, a lot more detailed than what he's going to have time to tell us today. But uh, still, uh, we're going to have a little treat at the end of the show. But first off, we're going to jump with Tesla News. Right after, I'll let you know about our sponsor, VMAX. If you're looking for a high-quality e-scooter with superior performance, check out the new VX5, VX2 Pro, VX4, and the R40 and R55 high-speed race scooter from VMAX. We're going to have a little bit more to say about all those uh, beautiful models later on on the show. But let's jump into the news this week, uh, starting out by uh, Tesla uh, entering into domain trigger mode, uh, domain levers, uh, and end of quarter push, end of the year push, really. And it's a, it's a strange end of the year for Tesla, just because normally the last quarter of the year is very good for sales for electric vehicles, especially with now with the tax credit in place, because... Uh, if you buy toward the end of the year, well, you have a, a lot quicker time to turn around the uh, tax credit and get your money back. That Rather than if you buy in Q1 in a year, you won't get your money until a, a full year, basically. Um, but in this case, there's uh, it's a double-edged sword where you have that, but at the same time, you have the tax credit in the U.S. is going to turn into a point of sale. Uh, tax yep. credit next year, which is even quicker way to get your money. So you could literally buy a Tesla vehicle on January 1st and uh, get that money the same day rather than uh, wait for your tax return later on in the year. So it creates a very weird situation for Tesla. But as the automaker has done over the last um, year or so, to create a demand, the, the uh, w w when there's a situation like that, they cut prices. And um, we've been uh, noticing this change in the last year also that Tesla is not just cutting prices on new orders, but it, there's a discrepancy now between new order prices and actually new inventory prices. Uh, Tesla has sporadically put zero discount on new inventory vehicle, which is a, a completely new approach from Tesla because Tesla, you know, Musk has famously talked about like not wanting to do discounts in the past. Now it is doing them. Um, and uh, now we're seeing them on Model 3 and Model Y, new inventory in the U.S. and in Canada too. Uh, in the U.S., it adds up to about a $3,000 discount compared to the new, new price. So you're basically way better off looking at new inventory than placing a new order because most likely than not, unless you have a very like weird bill that you're thinking about, uh, you're going to find something pretty damn close to what you wanted to order in the new inventory and it's available right there. So you have now like some, some and those new inventory vehicles are like super low mileage sold as new. So do you have access to the tax credit on it? So for the Model Y, you have, you can ha grab some at like uh, $47,000 and then you have the $7,500 on top of it. So it becomes like a a vehicle in the thirty thousand dollar range. Again, that is if you are eligible to the tax credit. Uh, not everyone is. Um, that, but that's another thing too. That is like throwing a wrench into Tesla's plans with the, yeah the tax Everybody's credit plans, next really. year. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Everybody's plan uh, next year with uh, the pe people that don't have the tax burden at the federal level. Well, the point of sale kind of take care of that too. So some people are probably waiting for that. If uh, but maybe not for the Model Y, but for the Model Three, it's becoming like cheap enough that uh, you can have some people that don't have a, a seventy five hundred dollar tax burden at the federal level um, that could afford really uh, uh, this car, especially when you start counting the uh, fuel savings. But at the same time, you kind of need to have that cash on end because uh, going with a loan is not cheap these days. Uh, but we also posting now there's another incentive on top of it with the new order you get six months free of supercharging on model three and model y you don't even need the referral program which was already in place before that so if you use that 
uh, you, you get the six the, the six uh, the six month free. Now everyone is getting six month free of supercharging, which is not a huge extensive, honestly, unless you're like a super heavy fast charging user. Uh, it might be worth a few hundred dollars, but uh, most people like it's it's gonna be like a few charges that they're gonna get out of that, and uh, that's uh, that's gonna be you know a hundred dollar, two hundred dollar max. Um, Cybertruck, not too much Cybertruck news coming out this week. Um, do you see the like the yellow orange tint on the image you see right now? It's just my screen. I think my screen is bugging out. I don't see it. It looks normal to me. You don't see it. Okay, it's my screen that's bugging out. Um, yeah, so two little quick tidbit of information. <laughs> we saw the Cybertruck cyber truck prototype being driven into the ocean, literally. <laughs> well, at least on the beach. Uh, here's the full video here. And I'm going to close. Okay. Um, yeah. So Elon Musk has talked about before that uh, he wants the Cybertruck to be able to float enough. Like that's a quote, enough to be able to cross rivers and more specifically want the cyber truck to be able to cross the send pad, the, the, the little, uh, like the, it's uh, like sea arm that uh, goes across the South Texas, the uh, from the star base to the South Padre Island. Uh, so it, I, I did the Google map on it and uh, it was like a thousand feet. Yeah. 360 meter, 1,000 feet of a crossing, basically. Here you see the cyber truck drive through the water. It's not that deep of a water uh, on the beach. Uh, pretty good. So some trucks still get stuck on that, like wet sand like that. So that's uh, that alone is uh, a bit ex impressive. But um, but yeah, it looks like Tesla is intensively testing this capability of crossing rivers with a cyber truck. Now I want to be very careful with that because. He's, Ilana has talked about things like that with other Tesla vehicles all the way back to the Model S that there's some floating capability like you say, oh, we can use the wheels at thrusters in the water even it's act like a bolt for a little bit but if you look at the warranty of Tesla vehicle like uh, driving in anything more than a pole of water will will uh, if there's damage it would not be covered by the warranty so now He's been pretty vocal, pretty clear about wanting the Cybertruck to have some floating capability and literally be able to cross river. If that's the case, um, there's a possibility that that will be reflected into the user manual and the warranty of the Tesla Cybertruck because otherwise it's useless. Like you, you show that to people and it's... it's, it's yeah, it's I sure. mean, salt water is particularly bad for steel, Good but point. I guess stainless steel is a little bit less bad for it. Yeah, uh, but uh, you know, salt salt water is horrible for batteries. Or I mean, obviously, yeah. they're the box is going to be waterproof. But um, uh, it's funny. Also, um, I, I think BYD showed a, one of their vehicles going through the water uh, this week. Um, oh, I missed that. Yeah, I think uh, Scooter did a post on that, and um, so you know, obviously, that was a response to this. Um, it just it's just funny that you know. Elon mentioned, uh, you know, I would like the Cybertruck to behave briefly as a boat and then, you know, like, and then as a submarine and then a coffin because, mm -hmm. you know, that thing's <laughs> going to sink eventually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what to think about that. Like, obviously, if it, like the, uh, this vehicle compared to other Tesla vehicle is meant for some off-roading at the very least. So it, it makes more sense that they would test the capability and they would um, ensure the capability. But I'll believe it when I see it on the warranty on the user manual, yeah. and not uh, Elon on Twitter. I don't. I don't believe it'll be covered on the warranty if if we're, if you we're don't? betting right now. Yeah, yeah. But at the same time, if, if like if someone were to test it and something happens and Tesla doesn't want to warranty it, uh, a good lawyer could like point to like these tweets from Elon and all that. Like it could be, it could be an argument that we made for sure. All right, the other uh, Cybertruck news this week that was interesting is that the car has shown up at showrooms. So when I reported that on the 20th, it was only two showrooms, but I noted that it might be more because we've seen a bunch of Cybertruck going all over the countries on, on trucks over the last week. And sure enough, since that article, uh, it has now showed up at 11 stores and counting. It looks like, and Elon said that it's going to stores all over America. Um, so this is a brand new strategy for Tesla. Normally, before a production vehicle launch, we have not seen the um, the vehicle at stores. 
I think it is very telling. I think um, I think this is a uh, demand incentive to the, the demand lever. Uh, we we've noted before, closer to the original launch of the Cybertruck, obviously that. Um, the Cybertruck was actually helpful for Tesla selling the rest of the lineup, the lineup that he could actually sell that was in production. Uh, to say the Cybertruck got a lot of attention, good or bad, and um, just it brought interest into the Tesla brand in general. It brought people into the stores, and people are like, "Hey, these these are the morons that threw a steel ball to, on, on that uh, on that truck and then made the news." And you go in and you're like, "Ah, oh, these uh, Model Three is actually pretty good looking. Why? It starts at thirty five thousand dollars. Wait a minute, I don't have to pay gas anymore." Uh, there's a lot of of that that happened apparently, and uh, now Tesla looks for a second round of that, knowing that there's going to be a lot of attention on the Cybertruck this month with the launch at the end of the month. And they decided to capitalize on it by sending trucks to the showroom before the trucks even announced. So all these showrooms that you can see on the picture here, the uh, they, they're roped off. So the truck is completely roped off. It's like only Tesla people are around the truck and they, they can talk to people about it. The, the, uh, um, they have some information, but apparently the information is uh, literally limited at what's online already. Like they're not telling you any new, new information. Probably they don't know either. <laughs> um, That's true. Yeah. And um, so don't don't go badger them and start about getting some new information about it. So also probably they just don't want people to peek too much into the interior, try to find new features that haven't been announced just yet. But they're there, and you can go for a little. For a lot of people, it's going to be the first time that you get to see one in person, that you can like guarantee to see the Cybertruck in person. It wasn't displayed a few times at Tesla events. It wasn't displayed for a while at the uh, Peterson Museum. So if you were in LA, you 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 pay a, P a Peterson Museum ticket, and you guaranteed to see one. But for the most part, a lot of people just had to to like find one. I know in uh, <laughs> when the uh, in, in Quebec last weekend, the Cybertruck was spotted on the road in Quebec, and all my friends were testing, texting me. It's like, ah, I want to see it in person. I want to. It's like so you had to like try to corner a prototype on the road to see it in person. Um, in a lot of places now, uh, you have a dozen stores in the U.S. where you can actually go see it in person. In California, in Texas, in uh, New York, uh, all over the place, really. Yeah, it's surprising we haven't seen uh, you know any of the stores like the uh, you know some manager or cleaning crew after hours going inside it getting some more uh, footage. Um, the other thing is is it's very telling that uh, it's it's you know walled off. Like uh, I I think that has to, like they could lock the doors and have people touch the outside and stuff. Mm -hmm. But I think it's weird. But that even getting into the window like that, I don't I don't think they want that. Like, yeah, they don't want that. And it's it's mm -hmm. kind of interesting that they don't want that because like what you know, what what are, what hasn't been seen that, you know, that like obviously you could go through the menu items and stuff in the screen, Yeah, I think but... that's one of them. Yeah. I think right. just like the 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 ranged uh, article last weekend, last week that we discussed, I think they don't want that. Like people try to figure out the range based on the the yeah, display. they seem particularly upset about that one. Yeah, yeah, we've heard that some people were at their invite to the event revoked for sharing that video. We don't have that problem at the light track. <laughs> Wait, didn't you get enough uh, referrals to go, or do you need? That? Yeah, but by the time I tried to order one, uh, the it didn't work. It was I mean, it, at first it was saying that they, there was some. But I I kept trying to place my order for it because I, I I specifically kept thirty thousand points just for that, uh -huh. and uh, it wouldn't let me buy it, and then it was completely gone within like an hour or so. Oh wow! A few, a few hours. Maybe you're on a blacklist or something. Yeah, I was thinking. Is it like it looked like a bug to me? But you never know. Yeah. Yep. All right. This is an interesting situation that's uh, still developing in Sweden. Uh, there is a what looked like a pretty easy situation for Tesla to squash a pretty easy union uh, unionization effort to squash, which Tesla has done plenty of times in the past with uh, bigger, uh, scarier unions. Uh, now it is uh, looking like one of the, the chances where Tesla could actually uh, find himself uh, in trouble in Sweden. So we, we talked a little bit about that before. The uh, service workers in Sweden, which is about 100 or so, 130 workers, wanted to unionize. And um, they went on strike. And Tesla, as usual, said, yeah, well, 
no, we, we now want to sign any collective bargaining agreement. And uh, there was not much happening with the negotiation. But what happened over the last few weeks, and it's been developing a lot, is that a bunch of other unions have uh, been striking, both or not striking, but boycotting work related to Tesla uh, in support for their service worker. Example, uh, janitorial staff that Tesla hired separately, well, they wouldn't do their work at Tesla because uh, in support of a service worker. Uh, the port workers at the port, if there was Tesla materials coming out, like full cars, they wouldn't unload them because yeah, I, I, they are part of a union themselves. And even though they don't work directly for Tesla, they don't want to support Tesla amid the situation with the Tesla service workers. Furthermore, uh, now the big one this week is that, uh, and that might be like the the, the straw that break the crown's back, is that the post. Uh, it, it's not. It's not actually the. It's not like USPS. It's a. Uh, uh, I think it's a completely separate company. It's not like a, a national company, but it, Post Nord, which has the contract with the Swedish transport agency that issues license plates. They have the contract to deliver them to um, to people that buy new cars. They decided the workers are also unionized, and in support, they decided when when they get a, a, a plate to deliver for a Tesla owner, they won't do it. So that means that Tesla cannot fully deliver a new car if they don't have a new plate. Uh, so one. that is a pretty crippling one, and that's one that Elon actually commented on. And uh, when someone posted the uh, the news on X. Um, uh, IF Metal is the is the union that is behind uh, that is supporting the Tesla service workers, um, so they are the one like organize. It lo looks like they are the one organizing a lot of that, like uh, getting those other unions to help. Uh, Elon said that this is insane, and the the crazy part of this whole thing is that it looks like nothing is happening on the negotiating table because. So Elon hasn't confirmed that himself, but apparently. Tesla Sweden, which is the one that they're negotiating with the employees, said to the, the union that there's no point in negotiating because they were uh, instructed by Elon Musk directly not to sign any collective agreement. So collective bargaining agreement. So they, they, what, what the union has said is like the, in the last two weeks, there have been no negotiation at all because they were told that so they were like there's no point for us to go to negotiating the table if we cannot sign anything with you guys so we not has taken a very hard zealot stance that like we're not even talking to you guys uh because we're not never going to sign anything and now uh the unions are like mounting the, as much pressure as they can with on top of like straight up striking with the service workers um they have all these things that pile up now there's been um Another one also, oh yeah, there's a supplier of Tesla in Sweden, a supplier that also is employing people that are in a union that they decided they won't supply Tesla anymore until uh, they do sign a collective agreement. So now it could be impacting vehicles outside of Sweden because this is a supplier of Tesla parts. So this is an interesting uh, step. Like this is, could, could, it could be like uh, implication now beyond Sweden, which is interesting. But it will be it will be interesting to see if Elon uh, shows himself to be a little bit flexible now on that front because he has so far not shown himself to be flexible. Yeah, at all but I mean, I mean, unions. the implications of of giving into the unions here are pretty big because if he shows or they show a sign of weakness, uh, that'll you know empower theoretically other unions. Although I thought Tesla in Germany was kind of like I thought all German auto workers were in a union. No, no, they, no. They've, they've been. There's been an effort more recently to uh, for IG Metal, similar to IF Metal, uh, to um, to unionize the the factory. And there was a thousand worker that did a, a little protest, apparently. But uh, I don't think they have signed an agreement just yet. Well, anyway, I mean, obviously, the United Auto Workers in the U.S. are super into uh, getting unionized uh tesla unionized and toyota and the other uh foreign automakers yes so since the if, big gains uh, if uh month, yeah if tesla gives in in sweden it's going to be a bad sign for that you know on tesla side it might be a good sign for the world but uh we'll see yeah um 
All right, next news. I mean, Jamie just joined in in the background for you guys, so we're, we're, he's not right right here. And we were going to bring him for the the Fisker stuff, but actually, it might be relevant to bring it might be relevant to bring in now for this next <laughs> next piece of news because we're talking about the Roadster, and it was an interesting move done this week where Elon announced that uh, Tesla is open sourcing all the design and engineering behind the original Roadster. They released. Uh, I mean, the service manuals and all that were already available. They are available for all Tesla vehicles, so that's not new. So the only real new things that they release is some documents, some R&D documents that are portraying mostly to, uh, I can show you here, um, the battery monitoring board, uh, HVAC controller, vehicle display system, diagnostic software. So it's not, diagnostic software is obviously very useful, but the rest, it's like, it's not that much. So it's not clear why they've done that uh, exactly. Uh, I don't know if they, it's a, like a signal that they won't be servicing the roadster in the future, or if it's a, a something where they want to help create some kind of replica parts market or not, but I would love to have Jamie's uh, take on this. Uh, how are you doing, Jamie? Hey, doing okay. Had a good Thanksgiving. Got a had some pie for breakfast today, which is always <laughs> my favorite thing. Because <laughs> I made That's too many breakfast. pies. Um Yeah, so I think honestly, I think the reason behind this is just because they don't want to service roadsters, you know. Um and if they put as much data as they happen to have out uh, out there, that the roadster community, which is, you know, significant and full of technologically inclined people um can build something uh you know maybe we can reprogram the vds system or something like that they've already done a lot of cool stuff like um ovms there's this phone app that you can use to connect and control everything on a car from 2008 before that even happened you know so mm -hmm. uh people have already done a lot of work um to do roadster mods and things like that and um I think it'll be cool to see if anyone can come up with anything out of this. You know? Yeah, there's a couple yeah, uh, there's, third parties. Yeah, there's a lining, I guess. But go ahead, Seth. Yeah, there's a couple of third parties that do that, like Uber Motors and what's that outfit in Seattle that kind of. Uh, it's, oh, geez. Wheeler and Sons? No, what's his name? Um, Sorry, I put you on the spot there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've met the guy. Uh, um, and Medlock and Sons, that's his name, Carl yeah. Medlock. Oh. Yeah. So basically, they're just handing it off to third parties. To sure, yeah. Those. And another cool thing is uh, Tony Williams down in San Diego with um, Quick Charge QC Power has a uh, Chotimo adapter for the Roadster, which is kind of neat and weird. So you can actually fast charge a Roadster on a Chotimo, which, of course, there aren't any more of you're barely any more of, but uh, he yeah, does have a, a mod available. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's relatively well, what fast. Kind of, what kind of charging speed do you get on that? I'm not sure what the charge speed is on it. Um, 50 kilowatts is the usual Chatamo max. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah that's I think right. that it'll do that. And the thing is, it's a 53 kilowatt hour battery. So, you know, that's yeah, that's pretty nice. What, what kind of range do you still get on your, on your Roadster right now? Uh, well, I just charge it up today. I'm going to a friend's giving, and it's reading 160, I think, miles. I didn't give it a full charge, though. I can probably get it up to 170 or 80, maybe. And you, are you still on your original battery on that? Yeah, original battery. 15-year-old wow. battery. Yeah, people uh, talk about... How many about, miles? Uh, I don't have that many miles. I don't drive it that much. So 32,000 or so. Yeah. But it's still. 15, 15 years old. Yeah. Yeah, mileage Impressive. is definitely a bigger factor than age, but age is the significant factor as also yeah, probably second sure. biggest. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll keep you on for the next few uh, the next few news item we want to discuss before we jump into your review of the uh, ocean and then uh, the pair. Well, a pair, I don't it's hands on not a review, but still uh, valuable information. Um, all right, uh, next piece of news we want to discuss uh, the congestion fee. Okay, this is a bit uh, of a controversial issue. We talked about it a few uh, last month, really, when uh, Green spotted the details in the uh, on the date of the app on the Tesla app. But now it was officially launched. We have the all the details. The main difference is the state of charge where the, the fees um, start to get into play, 90% uh, of an 80%. And we also have the 
actual cost of it here. So the congestion fee will replace the idle fee where it applies, uh, which uh, the criteria are pretty simple. Is like the supercharger has a congestion fee, the supercharger is uh, busy, and then your vehicle battery is already at or above, above their congestion fee. And the only thing that was announced is the in the U.S., uh, and that the, the level is set as 90%, like I just said, and the fee is a dollar per minute. So basically, once you hit the 90% charge at a supercharger that has the fee, and apparently that's going to be shown on the screen when you arrive at the supercharger, uh, or when you click on the supercharger in the, in, in the map, in the navigation system, and then you arrive there, and if you set your charge at more than 90%, once you get a 90%, you will be charged a dollar a minute. And if you know, like the last 10% is a lot harder, to, a lot longer to get. So that might be like a few minutes that you uh, have to, uh, quite a few minutes that you have to stay there. But there's also a five minute grace period. So I don't know exactly what that means. So that means like the first five minutes after you hit 90, you won't get charged. Hmm. I assume that's what it would mean. Sounds but, right. Uh, you said it to 92%. So you so you have five dollar basically less if you want to get to uh, uh, to get to to a hundred percent. So I haven't I've not charged a lot a hundred percent at supercharger if ever I think because um, normally you're better off if you're doing a long distance travel you're better off not charging that last ten percent and just get to the next station instead at the lower state of charge you're gonna charge faster. So it, to me it's not that big of a deal. But I after writing that article I got quite a few. People reaching out that were like upset about this, especially folks that still have like the unlimited supercharging thing, like where supercharger is supposed to be free at all time. And the idle fee people, I think, were a lot more understand uh, understanding of the idle fee because it's when the car is idle, it's not even charging. So it's not a parking spot. Obviously, it is uh, a charging station. So you should be charging when you're using it. But this is actually while still charging. I don't know what you guys think about this. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> if you're trying to get to 100%, like if you're, for instance, at a, you know, if if you're park doing street parking, and you need to get, you know, charge up like a gas station, or if you're eating dinner, and I mean, anymore, I go to a charging station, and it charges too fast. Like I'm, I'm not done eating before I have to go back out and, and move the car. So uh, what I used to do before this was just set it to a hundred and mm -hmm. then it would, it would charge slowly and I would get like 87% or something by the time we were done eating and, and go out to the car. But now this is, you know, kind of dials that back a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I would even I'm the be same at way. dinner. Sorry. I would even be at dinner set it at, it was already set at 90% or 80% or whatever. And then when I realized that, Oh shit, I'm gonna if we're gonna finish charging before I finish my dinner, I would use the app to uh, to increase it right there, and yep. like that would give me the time save. Yeah. Yep. Same thing. Yeah. Yeah. I don't. I don't really mind this too much. Um, I mm -hmm. feel like it. It takes a long time to get to ninety percent anyway, because you know it'll get to eighty percent pretty quick, but that next ten percent takes a while. And then, uh, whenever I'm supercharging, it's usually on a road trip or something. Uh, mm -hmm. in which case there is a bit of an incentive to get up and get out and, and start going. So I'm not sitting around for a long time. Yeah. Uh, and this isn't going to be everywhere. So like theoretically, yeah. this is only going to be where like superchargers are full or yeah. they're getting full. So, you know, getting people to move along. Yeah. I don't, I don't mind this. I feel like most places that in that institute something like a congestion fee, like for example, city centers in Europe, they have these congestion fees where, you know, you have to pay more money if you if there's too many cars around. It's like they get protests immediately, but they're also extremely effective. Um, this is a relatively low cost. Um, well, I mean, a dollar per minute is is quite a chunk, but, you know, it's it's not really going to kill people if you go a few minutes over. And yet uh, it will definitely make sure that people don't just sit there hogging a supercharger all day long and blocking it for several people, you know? Yeah, and we also have to note that the timing of this is coming at the same time as Tesla is opening the supercharger yep. to non-Tesla EVs. And Tesla has a lot less control on, on the charging station time mm -hmm. for those because they don't have as much data on how long it takes to charge a, a, a Taycan, for example. Uh, and the they can't send you a text message either. Yeah, that's Tesla a good point. App. Yeah, yeah. Maybe they should I mean, be a there could be a notification in the app. Yeah. Okay. 
in the well, but that, that's oh uh, yeah, no, yeah, you're right because the, the, you have to use the Tesla app, oh, yeah, to, okay. for non Tesla. Yeah. So yeah, they, technically they that's could right. be sending you a, a message through that, yeah, yeah, because that that's uh, definitely a big difference maker. All right, guys, you want to do the right. read? Yeah, we have a few more news items. Let's uh, talk a little bit about Vmax before moving uh, moving on. All right, today's episode is sponsored by Vmax Mobility Inc., one of Europe's largest. Uh, leading e-scooter brands. The brand was founded in 2015 and is headquartered in Switzerland. After eight years of growth in Europe, VMAX e-scooters are now available in North America. VMAX UL certified e-scooters offer exceptional performance and reliability with a motor battery controller and frame that are all built to last for years. The brand's high quality components are all made in VMAX's ISO certified facility for maximum control over safety and design. On the company's latest models, you'll find integrated turn signals, ultra high, ultra bright front lights, responsive brake lights, tubeless tires with superior tire tread, anti slip deck, and built in suspension. You'll also find a powerful motor, high torque, instant, responsible, in, instant responsiveness, advanced electronics, and regenerative braking for unmatched performance. VMAX offers an industry leading 24 month warranty and with nationwide repair shops and a local US warehouse for parts servicing is easy check out the latest vx5 vx2 pro and vx4 models and stay tuned for the exciting new vx3 if you're a speed enthusiast don't miss the company's r40 and r55 high speed race scooters visit vmax escootersus and use the promo code vmax electric for an exclusive offer for a limited time thanks again for me vmax for sponsoring and uh hit up the link in our show notes Yes, thank you, VMAX. All right, next week, some news that we want to discuss with you guys is, uh, well, a quick one here is the, um, you know, I'm talking about Tesla possibly investing in XAI. So a few weeks ago, we talked about uh, this weird situation that uh, Elon had with OpenAI, um, Tesla AI, Tesla's AI effort, and then XAI, uh, because originally he uh, officially remove himself from OpenAI because of a conflict of interest between Tesla and OpenAI because he believed that Tesla was uh, making an um, AI inferred that was bigger than just self-driving. He even at one point mentioned that he believed that Tesla could contribute to AGI, to artificial general intelligence. Um, so then, okay, so sounds good for Tesla investors. Uh, Elon's going to focus the AI effort at Tesla instead of uh, spending its time with OpenAI. I uh, kept saying that Tesla has the biggest, uh, the best AI team in the world. But then out of nowhere, he, uh, op- he starts his own AI startup called XAI and even starts recruiting from Tesla's team of AI uh, researcher. Uh, but he did say at first, oh, don't worry. Uh, Tesla is going to benefit from XAI. And what we learned, the first benefit, if you can call it that, is that uh, the Grok, which is the first uh, product out of XAI, which is a language model, it's, a, it's basically sort of kind of an AI assistant, is going to be integrated into Tesla vehicles. We have yet to see that, but there was indication of that in the uh, beta version of, uh, of Grok. I think it's that's how you pronounce it, right? Grok. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I've yeah. only seen it written. I've never heard anyone say it. And um, and yeah, so now this the second thing that just came out is that Elon said that he's gonna suggest to the Tesla board to invest in um XAI, which creates even more shenanigans between all of Elon's companies. Uh it did say that um Twitter or the X Corp now it's called uh, gonna own 25% of XAI. And now it's not exactly clear how Tesla is gonna fit into that picture, what kind of percentage, if any, they're gonna uh, get into the uh, ground floor of XAI. But it does muddy the water in terms of like, so Elon sold his Tesla stocks to buy Twitter. Uh, and then now, obviously, that affected the stock negatively directly uh, through selling billions of dollars worth of share, but also <laughs> indirectly through Elon having making a mess of the whole Twitter acquisition to start with, uh, affecting the brand and all that. And now Tesla somehow is going to get involved into X directly or indirectly, however you want to call it, through a partnership with XAI. So we have this whole situation to, to unload basically. So I don't know what, if you guys have any thought on that. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I have a lot of thoughts on it. First of all, you know, if if I'm a Tesla investor, and you know, I am a little bit, uh, you know, both through mutual funds, and I've held on to some shares, you know, over the long term, uh, I'm a little pissed, right? Like, you know, Elon's been selling like Tesla's got the best AI in the you know world, and we're, Tesla's going to do AGI uh, built in, and now he started a company outside of Tesla. And he's taking all of the Tesla employees out of there, like supposedly like the best in the world are moving out of Tesla. So like your Tesla investment is now outside of uh, the, the the company. And then Tesla wants or Elon saying that, hey, uh, Tesla's going to spend money at XAI. And theoretically, uh, XI, XAI is spending money at Twitter for their grok language model they're you know supposedly like using using the data yeah. using the data and like I'm, I'm assuming that's not free like that you know they're, they're gonna have to pay for that so in a way tesla's giving a lot of money to twitter through its this xai intermediary so uh it all sounds like shenanigans to me it, like mm. i if i was tesla's board and you know it tesla's board is like a bunch of elon's friends and his family so i don't know mm. if that's gonna mean anything but mm. uh I don't think I would be okay with that. I think I would be a little pissed that he even asked for it and even more pissed that a bunch of Tesla employees are going to XAI. Yeah, and I think this is nothing new for Elon Musk run companies. You know, there's a lot of uh, sort of an incestuous relationship between right. all of them. And uh, I think in the past, investors have been really uh, happy to sort of ignore that because uh the companies have sort of buoyed each other, but now it's becoming quite apparent that this Twitter boondoggle is really uh, not necessarily benefiting everybody. Right. Um, boondoggle is a new word for me. <laughs> yeah, it's a great word. It's I love using it whenever possible. And this is um, a great use case. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's a waste of forty-four billion dollars for to chase nothing, or well, to chase. I'll keep that off the podcast. <laughs> but, <laughs> it's but for what, free speech. It's for yeah. free speech. Oh, sure. Yes, of course. The free <laughs> speech of a specific set of people. Um, anyway, yeah, he's just, you know, he's definitely been distracted with things that are not really um, benefiting uh, his companies, I think. And right now, you know, AI is the tech buzzword. Um, everyone's got to pretend they're getting in on it, whether they are or not. Uh, you know, pretend that they have baby AGI when their car drives about as well as a baby. Um, <laughs> you know, so I don't know what all this is about, but I feel like I would prefer that not to happen and that Tesla, you know, build cars and do what it's supposed to do and have have the right mm -hmm. team for building cars and for doing AI uh, as it pertains to um, self-driving. Uh, but But all this other stuff, you know, Twitter AI in cars, I, that doesn't sound like anything I want to have happening. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I should mention too, uh, while we're at it, we'll talk about self-driving and AI. Um, I didn't I didn't add that to the, the post because uh, I posted actually after writing the podcast post, but Elon just confirmed that uh, V12 FSD is moving from um, engineering testing to Tesla employee testing which is uh, normally the last step before going to the customer beta fleet, which is not really a real, like it's the better, everyone is better right now. So all the, all the customers are, are, are gonna get it roughly around the same time. So it, he's basically indicating to us that he's gonna keep his promise of uh, getting us a V12 before at the end of the year, even though that promise has shifted because as of a few months ago, the promise was actually Tesla to achieve True full self driving by the end of the year. Uh, now it's getting V12, which uh, he didn't. He said that V12 is is not going to be beta, so it's going to be out of the beta. But he never even said what that means, being out of beta. Like, does it mean that uh, you don't the driver doesn't have responsibility anymore? Tesla taking the responsibility. You don't have to monitor the system. You can get your hands off. You can go to sleep. Like, what does that mean? I don't, I, by the way, I don't think it means any of that. Like, yeah, no. <laughs> so don't think about words for that. I'm just like, what does it mean to be out of beta? Um, but V12, for those not aware, that the biggest change in V12 is uh, neural nets end to end, which means like right now the neural nets are for the the computer perception part of of it, um, the, the image recognition. 
But when it's time to input vehicle control, that's hard coded by engineers. So based on oh, we get that information, well, you do that. Uh, now it's the neural net. So it's the AI that actually takes those decisions uh, based on training. And the idea behind that is that now you, you, you can train it over time uh, to get uh, better with, with more data coming in. Uh, so there's a hope that V12 is going to improve a lot faster than previous versions uh, because before that, the neural nets were improving just um, on the vision sides of things and i'm i'm a little bit hopeful on that front because i've always said that when it comes to full self-driving the thing that impressed me the most with tesla is the vision part the car seems to be able to recognize this environment fairly well based on the uh, visualization that you get on the screen mm -hmm. it looks like Tesla understand where the road is where you can drive where you cannot drive uh, where uh, where the cars are where the the pedestrians are the cyclists too more recently have been doing well on that uh, motor motorcyclists also but it's the decision making. Jamie just said it. It's drive like a baby. Like I, I've been a little bit um, more gracious on that front. And a baby, it's uh, I, I've been seeing a 13 year old that's just learning how to drive and sometimes does hard drugs too. I think yeah, uh, yeah, 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 the drunk teenager thing. Yeah, that. yeah, yeah, drunk or hard drugs is, is definitely what it likes. So maybe now they upgrade it to like uh, instead of doing like heroin on the on the it's like doing crystal meth a little bit like it's actually a little bit more uh, active yeah. when they, doing it they switch the drugs yeah yeah they switch the drug and maybe it's a 14 year old now instead of a 13 year old but still not even driving age uh but really so well, i'm sure that v12 is going to bring improvement uh improvements and it's most likely going to also bring a higher uh, a faster rate of improvements but really what i what i want to know is what's the plan exactly to actually deliver on the promise like so what's what's going to be the plan with the regulators with like showing the data um well, we, we should try to talk to people that were behind um the mercedes thing like like ask them about the actual like regulatory pro regulatory process to get that level three i know i know that tesla doesn't want to do level three but i i have a an intuition that uh tesla is going to begrudgingly end up doing a level three because that's going to be the only thing that's going to be like somewhat easy to get approved uh mm -hmm. i don't know that's like just an intuition that i have yeah also i would say that this beta is taking a long time i don't know if it's just it feels like it but like this this version i know it's the you know a big step change uh it seems like it's been months usually these things come you know a couple weeks to a month at a time yeah, but there's. There... I, I think I think the idea behind that it was with this one is like I don't think Tesla wanted to spend too much time upgrading V11, and they were like very focusing on V12, mm -hmm. uh, but also like fixing any type of bug in V11. So I think there was like they were balancing the two, like let's make sure that we get V11 at, at, a, at a stable level because it's a it's a one step forward, two step back type of thing <laughs> sometimes. So. And then at the same time, they were working on V12, which is kind of a new model entirely. So I don't know. It's a weird one. Yeah. All right. We have a few more news items to discuss, but I uh, forgot to tell you guys, if you want to ask us questions, you can put them in the comment section right now. I think we have a problem with Facebook today. Like for, we're, we don't have yeah. as many people watching and commenting right now because I think we're not on Facebook for some reason. Uh, but if you are on YouTube, you can put in the comment section right now. You can ask us a question about whether what, what we are discussing today. Uh, or any kind of a subject in the EV world that you want us to discuss. And if you have any question for Jamie on the um, ocean and the, and the pair, that would be the time to ask uh, before the end of the show so that he can answer to you guys live. Uh, before we move to the ocean, a quick note. Uh, we had, there was an interesting report from Goldman Sachs tracking battery prices. They, they track battery pack prices though not battery cell but i thought it was an interesting approach here because i I'm, put a grain of salt on the old thing because I, I think battery cell prices will be a little bit easier to track battery packs there's a lot more variant a lot more different things that people do the the, 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 the pack part of is not as big as the cell part obviously but it, i think it's the more the one that varies the most depending on how like a leaf battery pack for example without active um cooling and eating is that could cost a fraction of a, a pack from tesla for example uh not accounting for the the cell price but anyway 
So we've seen a clear trend over the years of battery prices going down, but that changed in 2022-2023 due to inflation and the price of, uh, especially the price of specific metals like lithium that shot up like crazy. Uh, nickel, also with the war in Ukraine, there was a giant spike in, in, in nickel. Uh, but these have stabilized lately, and now uh, in the 2023, we've seen a reduction versus the 2022 prices based on this Gummel SAC report. And now they track a giant, they, they predict a giant decrease in price in 2024, um, going down to $120 per kilowatt hour, uh, which... Oh, some big sounds here, I don't know why. Um, and then uh, after that, it's going to slow down the the rate of the uh, price drop, but still a little bit all the way down to the tracking it uh, to be at $80 per kilowatt hour in 2028, which is uh, insane to me because I think right now, like the price per kilowatt hour for the cell is offering at around $100 per kilowatt hour. So they think that that's going to go down and also battery pack level going down. Uh, yeah, for them, they not, track, uh, yeah, go ahead, I'm, uh, Jamie. I'm not hugely surprised by the drop in uh, prices because lithium was went up like three or four X or something like that mm -hmm. uh, in 2022. And I think literally everybody involved in the lithium in the metals industry was like, oh, yeah, this is going to go down. This is just like a, a bump in the road. And then it did. Uh, so, you know, this huge drop in battery prices this year and next year, it just seems like it's it was obviously going to happen because there was just a really short term uh, increase. Yeah, I mean, we see so uh, lithium is mostly in the cathode, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. And uh, you see that the cathode pricing here is uh, is one of the big difference uh, going from 2023 to 2024. So obviously the, the price drop that you just mentioned already happened, but uh, uh, that's not always reflected into the actual overall cost, just because of uh, pricing agreement between uh, mining companies and uh, and uh, the companies that process the lithium and the companies that actually sell you the cell and whatnot. So, all these things take a time to actually factor into uh, uh, overall pack level cost, which is what we're discussing here. And I think, if I recall correctly, a bunch of experts have said that uh, gas cars and electric cars reach price parity when the pack goes below a uh, hundred dollars per kilowatt hour and uh you know i thought it was cell level but i think you might be right yeah so I'd, i mean yeah i think that whole price parity thing is a weird conversation anyway because yeah, like right. if you look at the tesla model 3 right now or the chevy bolt like chevy bolt's already under 20 grand after credits the tesla model 3 you can lease for 329 dollars a month like those are very competitive prices versus any uh, gas car that's uh, uh, comparable. So it's like, I just think the conversation of, of price parity and battery packs is so, I, I don't know, it's boring to me. Just look at the Tesla Model 3, look at a BMW 3 Series and see which one you like better. And then buy the Model 3 because it's a better car. <laughs> but and to your point too with the pack level prices so right now 2023 they put them they put them about 150 dollars uh, per kilowatt hour well that's the average uh, so sure. like some some of them are going to be much lower than that some of them much higher than that uh so yeah there's probably plenty of them that are already at cost parity for if you have an exactly comparable gas model which is rarely if ever the case mm -hmm. I think it's my my power walls right now are making a, like a crazy sound, uh -oh. like a venting sound like crazy. It's weird. Huh. And and are are they on? Like yeah, uh, check your app. I didn't even. <laughs> I, I lost power earlier today for a second. Um, no, they say they're. Uh, I kept eighty five percent. That'd be cool if power went out everywhere in your neighborhood, and we were just podcasting through it. <laughs> but, uh, that happens all the time. I'm mean, not podcasting, but. Uh, uh, happens all the time just uh, in general in the winter here we lose something a lot of power mm -hmm. just for like a small period of time it's weird like tiny little brownouts but power walls have been great for that all right so you recently had the chance to uh test drive the fisker ocean um, i did 
so we've yeah. been getting a lot of uh, a lot of people ask us about about that vehicle and we we always just said and i respond based on what we know based on the spec and everything but yeah actual experience inside the car so mm -hmm. i know I, if if you guys have, re have read the post about it like you and if you haven't you, sh you should because it's a very extensive post but give us uh, like the short version of it with uh, your experience or general impression of the car yeah, I mean, it's, I know it's a long post. And the funny thing is I cut like two entire sections out of it. And it's still <laughs> 3,700 words. And I feel like I could have gone further. But uh, yeah, it's interesting because, you know, in terms of specs, in terms of price, uh, it's a really attractive um, setup. You know, it's a good, good sized car for people who like SUVs, which I'm a small car guy, but um, this, this fits in sort of the, uh, Range Rover Sport territory, like that size and that look. Um, and it's really tall, which I know a lot of people like to sit up tall. I used to be one of the people who likes to sit up tall. And uh, it really does give you a great presence on the road. Um, it looks good. I showed it at a car show. That picture right now on the screen is um, at a small car show. Uh, not a lot of people were out because it was raining. And um, people seem to like it. You know, everyone thought it was a pretty attractive vehicle. Uh, but when you get down into the software and the drive experience, I just don't think it's all there yet. Um, it, it really does feel like the car needs a little more time to bake. Um, cause the software is just not that great. Um, it, it's really, uh, choppy right now. Uh, and you know, using the maps, uh, doesn't quite work very well uh and and everything so the the organization of the software is fine it's just the performance is not very good and then i think that also applies to a lot of the drive experience uh, a lot of stuff just felt kind of loose um the accelerator wasn't as responsive as i'd like i think that was an intentional uh decision by them but um because you know one thing with electric cars is when you when you have a passenger and you you really jump on the accelerator uh, and it's a very quickly responding accelerator that can make the passengers a little bit sick. So a lot of manufacturers add a little bit of a delay there uh, to kind of ease in. But with the ocean, no matter what drive mode I was in, the um, earth, hyper or fun mode, uh, earth, fun and hyper in that order, um, no matter which one, it was just really kind of uh, slow. And then this video that you're showing right now, which is showing up a little bit choppy, if you look at the post, that's it's smoother. Uh, it's showing one of the fun features they have. They have these taco trays, uh, which you can, you know, eat on. It's like a like a airline armrest tray, mm -hmm. uh, and you can put your you know your food on there. You can watch uh, a video while you're doing it on the um, the front screen, which you can put into Hollywood mode, which turns it sideways so that it's like YouTube landscape format. Um, so yeah, it's got some neat stuff like that. The California mode, where all the windows Did, open. So, sorry, Jay, is, can, can you drive also like that? You, you can drive with the. You can't the drive with it horizontal, mm -hmm. and that's something that a lot of people ask too. I actually think it looks better horizontal, and it should yeah, just be yeah. horizontal all the time. But, yeah, because you uh, saw you saw the navigation on it too on the left side and everything. Yeah, yeah. exactly. But as soon as you put it into um, drive, uh, it'll go back, uh, or it won't let you put it into drive, and then you press it twice, and it'll let you put it into drive, and it'll, yeah, it'll automatically put it back. And I think that's an optional feature. It's on the extreme trim. I don't think the sport oh. trim will have that. Um, but yeah, they said that the vertical screen apparently. Uh, you know, the important information is more within your field of view when you glance over, which I think is true, but they could have just taken the whole screen and put it horizontal and and kind of lifted it up a little bit uh, so it was closer into the field of view. There it is comparing to a Model Y. Uh, the Model Y seems like it has a little bit easier cargo space to load things into. Uh, there's a Definitely lower load bigger floor. opening for sure much bigger opening, lower load floor, and it has more space in the area underneath the load floor. You know, that little secret mm -hmm. compartment. There's a bigger secret compartment under there. Um, the ocean seems like it would have a taller uh, cargo area. And I think it kind of does because it's a boxier shape. But the opening aperture, there's like a cowling there mm -hmm. so that the opening aperture isn't actually larger. So 
uh, it would be hard to to put things uh, into the vehicle. I think it's 26 inches tall. I don't know. I measured it with measuring tape, so it might not have been exactly right. <laughs> anyway, yeah, so it's, uh, I think it's a vehicle that just needs a little more time. Uh, I don't, I don't want to call it uh, bad or great. I want to say that it's something that definitely uh, could become better <laughs> in the yeah. next year or so. So I, I was thinking, like, so obviously Fisker with his previous startup had uh, some issues with manufacturing, engineering uh, part of things. And this time around, people are, were a lot more hopeful with uh, Magna being involved in the manufacturing. Mm -hmm. So does it, and now you come out and you say, like, it's a great car, but the software uh, is a big issue. And it almost right. sounds like Magna was so efficient in bringing that car to production uh, that yeah. it was too fast for Fisker's own yeah. engineering team, which I assume was in charge of software, that they could not be ready for it. And that doesn't sound like that big of a problem. Like you said in your post, it's most of these things could can be fixed with uh, software updates. Um, but at the same time, it's like, it's not that hopeful, the situation with uh, like the part that, Fisker was the one responsible of didn't deliver on is uh, is right. a little bit worrying to me. Yeah, no, it's there. It is a little bit worrying for sure. But the nice thing is, uh, Magma Magna made a car that that seems to work. You know, mm -hmm. and one thing you don't want is you don't want to have hardware problems because hardware problems are hard to fix. Uh, software problems in traditional automakers are just as hard to fix, but in, mm -hmm. you know, us new age EV startups, uh, they're a lot easier to fix. And I've been through this before with, with cars that had, uh, incomplete software, you know, with the early model three and with the early model S, uh, they did get better, you know? Uh, and I think that's, that's worth recognizing here. Um, there are a few problems I think that that either Fisker won't fix or can't fix. Um, it is pretty inefficient, um, at least in practice. I got way less range and way less efficiency than uh, than I expected to get. And part of that is because I was driving in hyper mode, but I wasn't okay. slamming the accelerator. It was just I drove in hyper mode because Earth mode was bad. It's just so laggy the throttle is it i just couldn't drive it i couldn't deal with it so and that's with the extreme model too yeah but you know, the, the earth mode is like the eco mode and they put a big old delay in the pedal and all that stuff uh i i think their choices to make it more uh more efficient were not necessarily the right choices because they just sort of limit the drive experience so over 135 miles on this, you average 533 watt hours per mile, yeah. which is yeah for a vehicle of that size, it's pretty bad. Yeah, it's I mean, that's, yeah, that's what I get on the Rivian. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's. I mean, it 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 should be more efficient than that. Uh, it is still an SUV, a big boxy SUV, but uh, it, you know, it's the size of a Model Y, so it really shouldn't. Um, be that inefficient even though the model y lies about its efficiency <laughs> uh, all right so if anyone that uh, has not read the post you should check it out jamie has a ton of information including a bunch of list of every specific issues that you had with with the software so <laughs> i think it's a uh, it's a good if if you're someone that is interested in, a, uh, in the ocean you won't be like necessarily i won't i don't want an ocean after that post but at least you will go into it knowing exactly uh, what kind of issue to expect. And yeah. then if you are someone that's confident that Fisker will uh, fix those issues, then you should be you should feel pretty good about uh, getting into an ocean. I, the only thing I would add to that is like, uh, financially speaking, Fisker is not in awesome health. Right. Um, so there's you have to factor in a, a potential uh, bankruptcy, and I'm not saying that they are about to get bankrupt, but they, it, it, it's trending that way, no doubt. Uh, they need, they're gonna need to raise more money, uh, so they, they probably can raise more money. So the, you're good at that, but like, how much time you can do that? Uh, obviously, the same things were said about Tesla back in the day, and look at them now. But it is still uh, there's 
you cannot ignore that there's a percentage risk of that happening. So you have to factor yeah. that in. I will say two quick things on that. Number one. Yeah, go ahead. They say they're making money on the cars that they make. Um, they are. They are. Positive gross margin. Is, they reported positive gross yeah, margin. Yeah, that is good. And number two, um, the experience of owning an early car, if that's the kind of thing that you like, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it is kind of it was kind of fun to be like an early Model 3 owner or to be there in the early Model S days where you really could just talk to the company and be like, hey, I want to fix this. And they'd be like, okay, cool. We'll we'll put that feature in and we'll name it after you. You know, like <laughs> if you're that kind of person, maybe this is the right time. But definitely take a test drive and see if you can uh if yeah, you like that's it. not bad advice. Yeah, and you, you know what? When you're on the street, uh people will be like, What the hell is that thing? Yeah, and we got I got stopped. So just I had it for a day and everywhere I was going, people were looking at it. It's not that conspicuous of a vehicle, but a lot of people mm -hmm. uh, were like, what's that new car? Or, oh, that's the new fixer, Fisker. I had, a, you know, several people stop me and, and say the same thing. And I wasn't even out for that long. So, Cool, cool, cool. And then the other one that you got to see is the pair, which is the, the smaller, uh, cheaper model that is going gonna, is gonna to follow the, the ocean um, relatively soon, I think, right? 2025. Well, you know, that's what they say. But hey, they yeah. got Fisker, they got the ocean out pretty quick too. So it's entirely mm -hmm. possible. Um, and this is a much improved version compared to the one that I saw just months ago um, where I didn't get to sit in it, but I did kind of glance through the window at the interior. Or someone opened the door and I looked in and wasn't supposed to. <laughs> but <laughs> uh, yeah, it was great. It felt great. Um, it feels very sort of EX30 or Chevy Bolt-like in terms of being like a smaller, you know, cheap workhorse vehicle that's just still uh, cute and fun and usable. And um, I was very impressed. And it's funny because I, I rode home uh, with a couple of the other journalists um, and they were saying the same thing. They were like, hey, is it? Is anyone else more excited about the pair than the ocean? <laughs> so I, I think we all were very impressed by it. Of course, it's still a prototype, but um, uh, it's just yeah, it looks pretty cool. Simple armrest mm -hmm. that allows Sorry, I, can, I was trying to mute it at the same time, and then the yeah. screen, the screen jumped out. The lava, it's not responding. Uh -oh. so, got it. Uh, yeah, this video function that we have on uh, on the side is not the best. Uh, Okay. Well, I think I think my computer or and or my screen is also like screwing up right now. Yeah. So uh, I'm gonna stay away from the, <laughs> the, <laughs> away from the video. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, we have it's... good pictures of it of the interior here. Absolutely. So what, what's yeah, yeah, that yeah. right here? Is that so? Is that the instrument cluster? It, it almost looks like it's flat to the dash. Yeah. So that's just a that's just a, a prototype so far. That's not the actual thing. Okay. But they say they're going to make the cluster look like that where it's like in the dash um instead of uh on a screen off of it and i think but it's not a it'll, it's display it's, it's still a screen yeah but it's not going to be like a separate screen it's going to be sort of um a lit up uh sort of semi-transparent plastic i think that they're going to hmm. use i don't okay. know it it looks really neat but it's still a prototype so we'll have to oh, see how I mean, we see better here okay. um yeah, exactly. Uh, so it, it was painted on for us, but mm -hmm. uh, I want to see how that turns out because it seems like a really neat design to me. I really like that sort of as a compromise between the the Spartan dash, which I like. I like the Spartan dash, and the um, and having the information there, which of course is useful to have. And then you still have uh, it's a five seater. You have a little yeah. uh, storage space in the back here. Five seater. They say there's going to be a six seat uh, with a bench seat in front, where they're going to take out the uh, the center console right. and have a six seat option. That's interesting. Uh, hmm. I haven't seen yeah. that. I don't think any car has that. They, you know, Cybertruck well, was Cybertruck supposed, to, was supposed to, and then they, they took it out. Right. Yeah. Because the center console is not actually a console; it's just an armrest. Uh, there's a little bit of space underneath it, but. Uh, and okay. then they have this Houdini door in the back, which is over-engineered and honestly unnecessary. Um, it looks neat, but what does it do uh, again? I remember them showing it at the uh, Fisker day, but uh, yeah, so it's like the remember. ocean uh, rear window where the rear window rolls down, but then also the rest of the door rolls down into the body of the vehicle. Oh, right, right. It's yeah. just the whole. I'm gonna, thing I'm gonna, ten, I'm gonna try the video real quick. We'll see, <laughs> see if it works. I don't know if I have. Uh, yeah, it has audio uh, on there too. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so this is it going up. 
Uh, so basically, but, you don't have. Um, can you just open it normally too, or is that the only way to open no, it? No, it's it only goes up and down. There, there's no like. So so you don't have down. that secret space that we just discussed in the ocean and then model Y. Right, because the door is gonna fold down in there, <laughs> which that's the problem. Yeah. Is it's gonna be in? It's gonna be a mecha yeah. mechanical problem. You know what I mean? I like. Yeah. I don't see how that's easier to repair or easier to to make work than a just a regular old door with those, you know, air, air pumps in them. Um, mm -hmm. And then it's also going to have a, a frunk that Fisker is calling a fruit because he wants to be something other than what <laughs> Tesla calls it. Uh, and uh, it's going to be like a drawer in the front, but we didn't get any pictures of that. But uh, they say that that's going to have, they're going to be able to put climate controls in there in case like delivery people want to use it for pizzas or something, which would be kind of neat. <laughs> <laughs> but also sort of unnecessary like they already have bags for that so <laughs> yeah why that's true all yeah. right the last piece of news that we're going to discuss real quick um we've been uh, but I, I see we, we have a few comments right now but not that many and i'm sure it's because of that facebook uh, thing that happened but uh i if think you guys people have any are also just doing family stuff because of thanksgiving maybe yeah yeah we do have fewer uh, live viewers than we usually do but uh Anyway, if you guys have any questions, we have a just two minutes to put them in before uh, we move on, but uh, you have some time. So we've been uh, discussing in the last few weeks this uh, the cruise being in kind of a shambles uh, with um, first, uh, well, first the accidents happen, and then they uh, got their permits revoked from the uh, California DMV, uh, Stop Operation California, then Stop Operation, uh, what? Well, so when I say operation, I mean uh, actual like test driving on the road. Stop operation everywhere uh, last few weeks. And uh, obviously when things like that happen, you would expect some heads to roll at some point. And uh, now it's happening with Kyle Vought, which is the original co-founder of the company um, and was made CEO even through the transition with uh, GM. And now is uh, uh, gone. He, uh, he quits. Um, so uh, this is uh, the latest development in the uh, and the saga that is uh, Cruise. Uh, there was also a, a thing last week that we didn't talk about, but uh, I think uh, GM sort of like now took completely over Cruise. It was like it's a separate entity, and now it's yeah. becoming like an actual division of GM, which I don't know how much that makes a difference because uh, GM was like uh, the majority owner already of it. I don't know there was like uh, an outside investor, like was it like the giant Japanese fund, the thing, uh, a SoftBank, Softbank, whatever. Yeah, it was an investor. <laughs> Doesn't have the best uh, track record. No, <laughs> no, they, they they like huge investments and uh, oh. they don't always pay off. Mm -hmm. They they made a ton on Alibaba, and I think since then they've been like over. Oh, yeah, yeah, they did. They did WeWork, and that was not. Oh, great. That's, <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, that's a flop. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, Seth, we can look at the few questions we have here, and then uh, that's gonna be it. All right. Uh, our first question, Dan Oberstay, uh, Tesla's big hammer that they could use to prevent unionization was their stock option offer. They could withdraw <clears throat> isn't as valuable as it was years ago. Stock stagnation could hurt them these days. Thoughts on that? I mean, they don't. The, the other thing is they don't have to not give stock options to you like there's no reason yeah, they could. Union employees can't get stock options so they say that but like that's just you saying that you don't want to do it yeah i mean it's it's literally like them them saying you know we're going to take away bathrooms like mm -hmm. yeah they, they shouldn't do that but they can yeah, uh, yeah i mean yeah. i think that comes from like uh elon's in his head there's like a clear demarcation between owners and like unions like it's either adversarial yeah. or like you're with us or you're without us and if it's a union you're not with us so why would you mm -hmm. be an investor uh which is obviously the thing that it's in his head because you there's plenty of unions that worked i mean in the u.s we have uh, less of a history of that but uh, other places in the world there's been a more yeah. harmonious relationship between unions and, and there I are companies that, right now we have a giant uh, strike right now all public workers are striking <laughs> But yeah, so, uh, it yeah. happened. There are also companies that are employee co-ops where the employees yeah. are the owners. So like this, it's not like a thing that can't happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But to Dan's point, though, yeah, I mean, the stock sanation is a weapon that the union can use now 
uh, amid the situation is like, all right, if you guys were uh, counting on your stock option as a significant part of your compensation, and now it's not anymore, uh, like there's no, well, I mean, it could still be like a 10x at Tesla, but uh, if there is, it's probably going to be the long term uh, compared to what it was before. So yeah, they can use that as a weapon. It's like, yeah, how about you get some good working condition and uh, 401k and all that instead? Yeah, uh, yeah. No, no, and that has always right now, that has always buoyed Tesla's argument of like, we pay more than everybody else does. Well, the reason is because you're counting stock options, and the stock yeah. options went up a thousand percent. And mm -hmm. if they don't go up a thousand percent, then that changes the calculus. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, you have to, to to admit that there's something cool about some. There 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 is there there have to be some production workers at Tesla that became Absolutely. millionaires from that, mm -hmm. which is pretty cool idea. Yeah, too, right? it's, I mean, in yeah. retail employees. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. We know a few. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Tyler. All right, uh, Tyler Hilliard says, in my opinion, for this to be fair, and I think we're talking about the uh, uh, the idle fees. Yeah, the congestion uh, fee. Yeah. Yeah, congestion fees. It should only charge if the station is actually full, not just determined busy. Um, yeah, I guess it's on. You know, it's a gray area because like you don't want people staying at a place that could turn into a full place. You want to kind of keep yeah, it and a little. Tesla didn't specify that exactly. They just say it is busy and uh, it has congestion fees. So yeah, Tyler might have a point there. All right, we have a big anti-union guy. <laughs> David WS saying Tesla should not give in to any union. Mm -hmm. All right. Mr. Turkey Neck brings up a good point. Uh, do you do any of you guys have a comment before Ford and GM backing up, backing off previously announced production numbers, release dates, budgets, new manufacturing operations, et cetera? And why is this happening at the present? Yeah. I mean, we've talked, you know, kind of back channel about like this being a really like, I don't know. It just seems like a move. Really, really short-sighted yeah. move by both Ford and GM. Yep. And I mean, like when you think about it, you know, Tesla dropping its prices quite a bit may have been the catalyst for this because, you know, uh, the Blazer SS and the Equinox aren't going to be super competitive against the Model Y. Um, the the Mach-E is not as competitive against the Model Y that costs 20000 less than it did uh you know at this year mm -hmm. this year last time or whatever so you know i don't know if this is tesla's low prices or what but like this is very short-sighted yep i you know i had a conversation with um he is communications manager at the la auto show and they're one of the few companies that hasn't done this that has said no we're going to keep building and um he said that he thinks it's a uh sort of a litmus test for whether people are actually paying attention to the numbers or just reading headlines. Uh, hmm. Whether people think that um, electric car sales have gone down or are having trouble. Because if you look at all the sales numbers, everything year over year is up about the same amount year over year as it was last year and the previous year, you know, COVID notwithstanding, because there's been a lot of fluctuations due to that. Um, I think just the fact that there's so many more models out now um, you're seeing uh, a lot of models competing for the same amount of buyers. You're also seeing the effect of interest rates, the effect of Tesla price cuts, the effect of, you know, the Model 3 Highland coming out, the effect of the new tax credits changing in the middle, uh, in the beginning of the year, the effect of everyone switching to NAX, and maybe people want to put off a mm -hmm. year for NAX. There's just so many different things happening right now in the electric car market that uh, anyone who says, oh, you know, people don't want as many electric cars as we thought they would is just not paying attention and anyone who doesn't invest now three years from now they're going to be screwed because yep. yeah uh, and i think the uh, you know, everything happy. you said is is correct and then you had to that also the in the u.s market the uh, tax credit it was the first year of the reform tax credit and mm -hmm. there was a lot of weird things that happened like the model three we don't even know how the lfp got the tax credit there's there's a lot of things that are just making the market messy right now and then next year also the point of sales coming coming into into play that that also changed things so as uh, when, when a few of these things will shred in themselves out over time, and I think when the second half of 2024, especially if we can get the interest rates down, uh, I think things are going to start to look a lot more like we've been expecting things to look for for a while. At, well, at least at Electrex, since we've been uh, pretty uh, 
gone ho about um, EVs taking over. And even it, then, we're still up fifty percent since last year. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, what do you expect? Like, yeah. I, I, I don't know what they what the numbers needed to say. I mean, I, for me, it felt like they didn't feel like they had competitive off offerings against uh, what Tesla was was there. That's the point. Like the F one fifty Lightning, for example, that's a good point. They like like they thought they were, were first to market with an well, Rivian also, but they, I don't think a lot of people took Rivian as seriously as they should. But um, they were like, we're the first legacy automakers with that. But the F one fifty Lightning is a is a great vehicle. But I I, I think. The real F-150 Lightning is the next one coming. That's the the real one. There's some drawbacks to this one. That makes sense that they you know they are not selling 150 thousand a year like they, they were supposed to. And it's twenty thousand dollars more than they said it was going to be. Yeah, so like that. a lot of, uh, of those vehicles that were announced. All right, we have All a right. question about the Fisker. Yeah, uh, Dan Overstay again. Uh, Fisker Ocean looks like it has a narrow passenger compartment for the wide wheel well, uh, wide wheel stance it has. Why give up passenger room if the wheelbase is so wide? So I'll tell you, I didn't sit in it with uh, five adults. I only had it for one night, and I was just kind of trying to figure out what I could do. It's been a busy week. Um, but uh, it felt pretty uh, large inside. You know, there was lots of headroom, lots of leg room. Uh, the one thing I noticed is that I had two larger passengers, and they said that the seat seemed a little narrower than they thought like the passenger seat mm -hmm. seemed a little narrower so anyone who has a really wide seat uh perhaps will uh notice that i did not notice that uh myself because i drive a roadster <laughs> so yeah any car has yeah, a large you cannot complain in, a, in an suv <laughs> but yeah, yeah. I, I do remember seeing the seats and they look narrow to me uh, yeah. for not not like hugely narrow but just a little you know an inch or two less wide than uh than people might otherwise think but then in terms of the rear i don't i didn't sit three across on the rear but um everything felt tall and and long so plenty of room for the heads and the legs all right uh so let's just close it out here sylvian says not a lot of people uh were on maybe because they didn't get any notifications or reminder yeah something weird is going on with the the video yeah I, I looked up at my notification and also didn't get a youtube notification so he's right uh, something bad happened uh, yeah have to look it up. Also uh, still about uh 70 or so of you here we appreciate you watching live um uh there's a question about xiaomi huawei and fox sound play in the 2030 auto landscape i mean it's a little bit early to tell. They're clearly uh, very busy there. Yeah. Um, they're huge companies. They have great technology. Fox uh, One seemed to be the more serious player in the three, and it looks like they're gonna do some kind of uh, well, like what they do with the phones, really, where they you know have their own brand, but they um, they're gonna manufacture for for others like Magna, for example. So, yeah, I was just thinking uh, about Magna. Well, for Fox them to become Con... a serious player. Foxconn yeah. supposedly is going to be doing the pair. Uh, oh, oh, did I oh, did I say Magna? Okay, I didn't say it. Great, <laughs> I mix okay. it up a little bit in the articles. Um, yeah, Foxconn supposedly is going to be building the pair and in the U.S. Uh, oh, in their, their okay. factory. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that's um, you know, if that works out, that's a big deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. And then last... we have a Jamie fan. I'll take it. All right. J Dan Overstays, uh, to Jamie fan. Jamie should be on every week. He brings a lot to the live stream. We'll we'll uh, we'll try to get you on as much as possible. Make yeah, sure you every time you do a review. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, <it's, laughs> the show is not too early. Uh, yes, I've truck next week, dude. He's right. Uh, so it's the 30th. This is going to be a Thursday. So uh, we're going to be on basically uh, the next day. Uh, on Friday, mm -hmm. next Friday, we're going to have the Probably the most of the show is going to be talking about the Cybertruck event. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Uh, we appreciate every single one of you that's been watching. Uh, if you do enjoy the show, please give us a thumbs up, a like, a subscribe. If you're listening only on the podcast app, you can give us a five-star review. That helps a lot. Free to do. Takes a second. It helps the show more than you can think. And uh, we're going to see you same place, same time next week. 